Looking back to the days where real-time strategy games were in their stride, one such developer, Massive Entertainment, decided to strike out with something on a grander scale. So it's time to go back and talk about 2000's Ground Control, where huge maps, streamlined gameplay and artificial difficulty coalesce into a decent package. Not only does Ground Control work as a good bedrock for what Massive would do in the impeccable world in conflict, they're never going to make a sequel, are they? But it also started the shedding of RTS genre staple notes of base building and resource gathering into purely strategic management of units and tactical combat. Very cheap digital re-releases on GOG and Steam have made playing this on modern OS's a non-hassle, at least for me. There is some editing shenanigans going on here with the footage, as the default aspect ratio caps out at a paltry 1024 by 768 a fan-made EXE tweak can set it to 1920x1080, but that makes the UI and menus very small. It's still playable and didn't crash in my playthrough. The 2000s were absolutely filled with big budget strategy games, and Ground Control spares no expense in capturing a grand presentation. Hundreds of years into the future, where a third world war ended with the United Earth government and mega corporations colonizing space, one such faction, Craven, is fighting it out with the religious zealots of the Order on Krieg 7b a planet host of vast alien artifacts and possible doomsday weapons. It's initially the typical amoral war story, although what's neat is that you take command of both sides for 15 missions apiece, with the first half devoted to Major Parker leading Craven forces, and the second half as Deacon Stone as he rebuilds the Order's armies and mounts a proper counterattack. Throughout it, both are trying to pass out the bigger picture and the ongoing machinations of their leaders. It's a small cast and it leans into the usual tropes of cutthroat corporations and technology hardest, but there's good production values on offer. Pre-mission briefings, inter-level communications, and after-action reports devote their time between relaying the story and outlining your objectives. The ample voice acting is carried by talent like Jennifer Hale and Greg Berger among decent flavor dialogue from each unit, a la StarCraft or Homeworld. Hearing characters argue or react to some new challenge makes each scenario a lot more interesting than it otherwise is. Sorry, darling. That uh, building just sort of blew up, didn't it? What crappy construction. You utter pig. Oh. That's because, despite all the backstory lore and substantial world building, the story is just about a bunch of stuff that happens. The alien artifacts are a slow burn mystery for many hours across the campaign. It initially seems like they're setting up for the emergence of a third alien faction, like the Flood or Seraphim, and yet, nope. Nothing really comes of it, and instead the plot only earnestly begins in the last four missions of the campaign, until then it's just fighting Craven or Order forces. By the end, there's a setup for a potential sequel or expansion that would resolve these big mysteries and reveal the puppet masters behind the conflict, but the expansion, Dark Conspiracy, is just more stuff that happens, and Ground Control 2 basically retcons the original story for something totally different. This isn't uncommon for strategy games, it's just always annoying when this shit happens, so while the narrative is well presented, it doesn't mean much. That leaves the actual gameplay, which is what Ground Control is more well remembered for. The crucial change here is that the base building has been totally removed in favour of objective based missions that focus on tactical decision making and offer up more scripted set pieces. This wasn't necessarily new, with myth and close combat functioning the same way. It was how it functioned alongside a story driven campaign and faster action that made it stand out so much. Every mission begins with you outfitting your dropships with a sizable array of units from infantry, APCs, tanks, aircrafts, and heavy weapons, which you then deploy in a pre-established position on the map. This isn't as freeform as you'd hope, as you're greatly restricted in force composition, which numbers at most 13 to 14 units by the late game, and you're not reinforced in missions aside from AI friendlies. Your only source of repairs is your command APC, which if lost, is game over. Its recharge range is quite short, which can make piling around it quite a hassle and an easy target. Moreover, units in ground control are very temperamental and specialised. While there are many opportunities to use them, there really is no dominant unit per se. Infantry can take out light vehicles, but are ineffective against heavier units. Aircraft can decimate armour columns, but are extremely vulnerable to anti-air fire, which themselves are incapable of fighting off ground units. It's very much a rock-paper-scissors approach, there's no ace card that ensures a win. While both factions do share similar rosters, there are different respective advantages. Craven forces are more traditional fare, projectile weapons, high explosives, good hit points, but are cumbersome to move. Order units are more maneuverable and have homing attacks, but are also weaker. Each unit has different equipment and abilities that can be deployed, which range from simple repair kits, anti-personnel or armor rounds, shields, speed boosts, or radars. You're greatly limited in what can be carried at once, so you'll often arrange your units to better complement each other. 
For example, if you've got some anti-air weapons, you can avoid using up a unit slot for a dedicated anti-air vehicle. This all makes pre-mission planning crucially important. You can easily lose a mission because you don't have the right units, and you can't just brute force an area without sustaining unrecoverable losses. You can make minor stat tweaks, and squads are carried across missions, but the benefits are negligible as you're always rearmed. For some reason, when you restart a mission, it doesn't save your loadout, forcing you to retweak everything again. At least you can pointlessly rename your squads. Moving and ordering units around is simple. The very uncluttered UI makes this apparent with only basic orders like defend or attack and a few formation varieties. What's annoying is how both mouse buttons select and move units, so you'll frequently try to select a unit and instead of move a different one, which isn't great under pressure. This is small potatoes compared to the unit pathfinding though, which leaves much to be desired. This is an issue common in early 3D strategy games, so I can't fault the devs that much. Unfortunately, as some units are squads instead of individual pieces, they can easily get caught in the terrain, which results in them getting split up and easily destroyed. It also makes boarding infantry a total fucking pain. As your units are so vulnerable, you'll usually equip them with repair or medical gear so a single mistake doesn't result in your entire force being crippled. This ends up making aircraft somewhat worthless as they lack any repair function, meaning they get annihilated near instantly. A lot of units aren't very effective as their projectiles need to outright hit a target or they'll fire uselessly as some terrain or cover. This, somehow, results in infantry standing firm against fucking battle tanks and special attacks being totally wasted. <laughs> the order forces suffer this issue less as they got absurdly effective homing anti-vehicle rockets. No surprise that their campaign was substantially easier. It all results in using artillery pieces for saturation fire is the most effective game strategy. They have extensive range, great AoE, fast refire rate, good accuracy, and unlimited ammunition. The AI isn't very adept at countering this, and with sufficient placement, the defenses are curb stomped, albeit it goes both ways. What I found, despite all the options, that you'll probably have the same loadout of heavy tanks, infantry, anti-air, and arty stage to stage. Unless you're well aware of the opposition from successive retries, you'll always want to hedge your bets, as even losing a few units essentially means failure. Mission objectives are usually a selection of three, defending an outpost, destroying an enemy base, or protecting some NPC. The game occasionally has scripted moments, like ambushes or racing to an evacuation site. There are power generators that can be destroyed that will deactivate automatic defenses. I would have loved to have seen more of this, like taking a command center reduces the enemy's reaction time. For 2000, this mission structure was pretty decent. However, it was Ground Control's truly enormous maps that went well beyond the norm that was so impressive, particularly it all being in 3D, none of that sprite business. By gazing across the map, you'll notice all the valleys, plains, and forests that you'll traverse through. There's a large selection of biomes from tundras, marshlands, and deserts, although little unique vegetation or wildlife, except these chunky boys. It just makes the world feel empty, especially as you'll spend a good portion of time trekking across the vast expanses with no time dilation feature. The units and buildings, however, are very well detailed. The animations and proportions are still neat as you zoom down to ground level, where you can clearly see the doors, wheels, turrets, and gear. Cleverly, the buildings are all the sorts you'd see from a traditional base builder, and have some really neat details themselves. This again, was mind-blowing stuff 20 years ago, and the fluidity of it makes managing these battlefields so much easier. Overall, the scale of each stage and streamlining of gameplay lends to some very fun and exciting combined arms gameplay. You'll lead enemies into kill zones, coordinate different units and their abilities, clear out bases, bombard installations, and mostly have a good time. There's not much music, but the particle and sound effects are satisfying as you blow up bases and armies alike. Even so, the defining challenge for ground control and why many will struggle when playing is the lack of any saving feature or even mid-mission checkpoints. Whilst you're allowed to change between difficulties for each mission, it's still quite easy to fail for the artline reasons, or your command APC gets stuck, making the mission impossible to complete, forcing you to reset an entire 30 to 40 minute level. I will appreciate how the lack of saving reduces the usual safe scumming techniques that plague RTSs, nevertheless, these issues could have been mitigated if there was some breathing room, like being able to capture enemy outposts to replenish your troops or obtain new ones. It would have made their placement a logistical consideration instead of just some set dressing that you blow through. Or just make the fucking travel distances shorter. As it stands, I just can't imagine playing the game on hard, as the campaign is already plenty long at 12 hours, if not more, and that was on the second lowest difficulty. There's the Dark Conspiracy campaign, which has all the same problems and less polished levels, but it's included in every digital copy of the game, and if you like the gameplay loop, then it's a decent extension. 
There's a lot of really neat RTS gameplay on offer here in Ground Control, if you don't mind overcoming some of its datedness and questionable design choices. It certainly doesn't outweigh its accomplishments, which help pave the way in modernizing the genre to what we see today, like in Wargame, Dawn of War 2, Steel Division, Blitzkrieg, and the Company of Heroes franchise, to a lesser extent. In that manner, if you want more of the same, or you want to explore the origins of this evolution, I can confidently recommend checking out Ground Control. Enemy structure destroyed. <sighs> I just want another world in conflict. Mission accomplished. Enemy structure destroyed.